when there's chaos, there's opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And there's opportunity right now. The proof of work crew is on the move. Scotty Braun, Anthony Burrell, and we have super investor, super entrepreneur, super shark. Google him if you need more info, you should. And Kevin O'Leary is with us and also super crypto investor, which we'll get into. But Mr. Wonderful, we appreciate the time. Great to see you. Great to be here. Thank you. Have you ever done an interview like this? No, this is unique. <laughs> we are on the move in the car. And are you ready to sing all of your answers? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How's your voice? Listen, I'm a pretty crappy singer, so you know, we'll see how that goes. All right, then we'll, we'll just stick to normal words then. And let's, let's dive into the very generic front question of Mr. Wonderful is invested in crypto. You are a big proponent of it as well. So when did you get crypto pilled? How did you get sucked into this industry and become such a big proponent? Yeah, it's a great question. But you know, back in 2017, 2018, when the first tokenization of debt occurred actually here in New York on a hotel deal, uh, the regulator came down hard against that and uh, saw no merit in it at the time. And when the regulator makes a move like that, and if you're a fiduciary like I am and you work in a compliant world where you have to be compliant as an issuer of things like indexes and ETFs, which is what I do, uh, we couldn't touch it. And then all of a sudden things changed. Regulators in Canada, Australia, Switzerland, the United Arab Emirates, in Canada, for example, brought out the first ETF market I'm in with Bitcoin as the underlying asset. And then a week later, Ethereum is the underlying asset. I go, wait a second, what is going on here? I mean, a regulator allowing that? And I realized this asset class is coming, and that's when we started to do our work and I put a team together in our operating company saying, guys, we got to start allocating. Yeah. We got to start, you know, we don't know with certainty what's going to happen, but and what a wild ride it's been. I mean, it's been crazy. But I'm still a believer. I, I actually think in, within a decade, crypto will be the 12th sector of the S&P because it adds so much productivity to the other 11 sectors. I mean, how do you see it from an enterprise perspective? Like, I know that you mentioned to, to your peers, you're like, guys, it's software. It creates business efficiencies. Like, I'm assuming you truly believe in the underlying asset and the underpinning technology. Yeah. The smart contracts and Ethereum is running sort of like the HTTPS protocols run behind the scenes on the internet. Like, it's just going to create efficiency and liquidity and reduce friction. It will, but you can take a very real use case. Let's say you want to transfer. Let's say you're doing a commercial transaction where you're buying some real estate. Uh, you're, you're, you're operating a real estate fund in New York and you want to buy some real estate in Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Right now, your options to transfer uh, capital to Switzerland yeah. are the old archaic transfer systems, the Fed wire or ACH transfer or a, you know, a typical SWIFT mm -hmm. transfer. That may take you three days. Yeah and cost you a lot yep. and be very slow and very often as we found because we do these kind of transactions they lose the money for 36 hours they mm -hmm. don't know where it is in the system it bounces back or yep. you, you don't know where it is if you use a stable coin for that you know within half a second that the transfers occurred it's totally transparent yep. it's very very inexpensive it's completely auditable it's very productive there's no bad guys can use that because you know who sent it and you know who got it you can set up, know your client beforehand. So yes, I see a lot of productivity and I'm a big believer and I'm an investor in that space. And what happened in crypto this year, this, all this craziness, doesn't change that fact. No, no, I think it doesn't at all. I mean, going into the craziness, I mean, what's your take on NFTs and Web3? Like, do you, ah. think, they're tor do you think they're tulips? Do you think they're here to stay? Like, what's, uh, what, what's Mr. Wonderful's take on well, that asset Well, I, I believe in NFTs as vehicles of authentication of physical assets. Yes. That's how I'm investing in it. So. You know, I recently bought a piece of, of art and I told the artist that I'm not buying it unless I have an authenticated NFT that goes with it. Yep. And so <clears throat> that artist arranged for that and, they, and I, I moved it into my wallet and said, okay, now I can buy the art. And now, I, now anybody that purchases that from my state forever knows that it's an authenticated piece. So for me, that works. Um, you know, apes and JPEGs and that's all garbage to me. Yeah. It has no use. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's true. And I mean, we've we've actually built a protocol on Polygon tokenizing sports cards, um, tokenizing physical assets, bringing them on chain, which was one of the main reasons was to create that true record of provenance. Yeah, that, that makes that, that, that makes total sense to me. I, I do the same for pens, for watches, that kind of thing. Yep. Wine? Wine also could make a lot of sense. It hasn't happened yet. There's been four or five projects looking at that. We're working, uh, We're working yeah. on it. <laughs> because, because for really high-end DRCs and some, you know, collectible burgundies, Bordeaux's, you would want that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's very, I think it's very important, especially. But I mean, you need those true one of one assets with the unique identifiers to embed into the metadata. Well, if you're talking about a DRC, it's yeah. got a serial number on yep. it, and so you want that authenticated, and you want to know when it was actually brought to market and where it was, the provenance of where it was stored, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So I, I see the merit of that, and that's going to be the promise of. It's interesting you said Polygon because. You know, the, the chains level one and level two that matter have apps like you're talking yes. about. That's where there's economic merit. So that's why I'm, I'm going to be, uh, in our portfolio, reducing the number of positions that we take on. The question will always be, what is the merit of this particular asset? Yep. You know? I, I, think that, I think that's a great, great, great point because there isn't a lot of merit in a lot of NFT projects and a lot of the altcoins. But you look at things like Polygon, Chainlink, ETH, Bitcoin, they have true real world applicability. And yeah. I mean, it makes it makes sense in the long run. And I, and I think that's been reflected in how they've held up in pricing through all this volatility, where you've seen just decimation of 97% loss are all the, excuse me for saying this, but it's the, it's the term that's applicable, shit coins. Yep. They, yep. they are shit. Yeah. And so, yep. you know, they, they, and everybody started to figure that out, saying, why do I own all this crap? And, and as a result, we're going to see a consolidation of, of uh, tokens. So I think you're, you're, you're in congruence with the executives over at Nike and Starbucks as they've ch chose Polygon for their, for, for their Web3 infrastructure. Yes, I mean, Sol Solana um, also has or had or could have potential because of its speed. Uh, it's now tainted by the FTX fiasco yes. and so that could hurt it, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, but it, it's another project and then there's one I recently invested in uh, that came out of Facebook. Uh, Evan Chung brought out uh, Sui. It's it's a new um, attempt to really speed up transactions. Okay. And, and uh, Mistin is the name of that project. Okay. So he was able to raise three hundred million dollars in forty five minutes okay. because he's got such credibility. He was the guy building out the payment system for for Facebook. Okay. So he was on the DM project. Exactly. Turn, okay. Yeah. So when you're sitting down with somebody who knows next to nothing in this space. Where do you start? Because obviously you're very well respected. You've picked a lot of winners in life. So if you sit down with, say, a buddy from growing up, and he goes, "Talk me into this space. Where do I start?" And if he doesn't have a lot of knowledge in finance and in Web three or crypto, how do you make it relatable? And how do you sell him like a Shark Tank pitch, basically? Yeah, I, I tell I tell people, and I have many conversations like that with even professional hedge fund managers and, and uh, private equity uh, people I work with who want to understand this asset class, they know it's not going away. And I say the best thing to do with this is to take $100 and invest it in Bitcoin. Yeah. And go through the process of figuring out how to do that because it's not easy to do that actually. You can go with a centralized wallet uh, like uh, BitBuy or you can do a decentralized wallet, uh, but they don't even understand those terms. Which also explains to you why the potential of this is so untapped until a grandmother can safely buy mm -hmm. Bitcoin on her phone, um, we're not going to advance this sector. And, and it's more about the wallets at this point now. They're so complicated. Yeah. Security is so lax, so weak. Whether you're in a decentralized or centralized exchange, my goodness, it just it proves to you that um, it's a mess. With that being said, I mean, do you believe that CEXs truly need to exist in this ecosystem to get users on chain? You know, it's not clear. Yeah. It's not clear anymore, and and so I, I'd like the market to make that decision. I'm not going to second guess it. I, I I just feel that if you're thinking about diversification in a portfolio, as I do, um, there is a place for crypto. Whether it's going to be in in my world, I have a very simple um, uh, methodology that we apply that has saved our hiney in the cases of all these crypto collapses. No more than 20% in any one institution. Okay. Okay. Ever. So if, if I'm going to own crypto, I'm going to have five platforms to own it on. Mm. Number two, I never have more than 5% weighting in any one individual name or 20% in any one individual sector. So our mat, the, the, the highest exposure we got to on crypto was 20%. Okay. It's now down to 14.5 after the correction. But it was held across multiple institutions. Yeah. And so when you know we have a collapse of an exchange, a, you know, an unregulated exchange, it's unfortunate. but. It, it doesn't, it hurts, it's a hit, but it doesn't change uh, how we're going to invest because yep. you've got to stick with this discipline of both institutional diversification and asset diversification. Yep. You know, you can say that, oh, Bear Stearns was a fantastic, you know, brokerage house. Yeah. Uh, 
What's Bear Stearns? It's gone. Yeah. Lehman Brothers, gone. Yeah. FTX, gone. Who's next? Gone. You know, it's it's. So that's why I just never let my get let myself get in a position like that. And on the FTX thing, I'll add something else. I'm feeling very fortunate about, even though it was a huge hit, because I was a paid spokesperson. I never put any of my LPs into FTX yep. because I was, I felt conflicted. And the one that really I took heat for was when they brought the FTX US equity deal. Mm. It was the hottest deal in private equity. I was getting hounded by people saying, you owe me a piece of that. Okay. And I said, guys, I can't do that. Yeah. And they were saying, oh, you're just using that as an excuse. I said, no way. I'm a paid spokesperson. I'm totally conflicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be supporting this as a paid spokesperson. And, and you're telling me that that's not arm's length? And so, you know, uh, that has turned out to be a very good thing. Have they yeah. called you back since and said, hey, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for saying you, no. You, you know, it, it's because the problem for everybody else that actually managed FTX holdings or FTX accounts as a fiduciary is they've got litigation coming both ways. Yeah. From the top and the bottom. Yeah. Before this is over, there's going to be so many, you know, class action suits and everything else. But the only person I'm pissed off about in the FTX situation is me, at myself, because it's it's my money. Yeah. Nobody else's. So you know, let it be what that is, and that's fine. And I've learned. I, I listen. I've made lots of bad investments. This is just another one of them. But luckily, I've made more good ones than bad ones. That's, Absolutely. That's how you win in this game. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if you're commissioner, I like to do this in the sports world. If you're commissioner for a day of this sector, what do you do? I know there's a lot of discussion going on within the government about acts, laws, bills, oversight, where it's going to go, who's going to oversee this. What, what's something that you would do as overseer for the day? I would pick one thing and regulate that first, and I would do stable coins because yep. it's a very simple uh, idea. Um, and the reason it's simple is if you look at the act itself, and I spent a fair amount of time in the Hill uh, looking at this, and, and you know, the, they brought a lot of private investors onto the Hill, the, the regulators and the lawmakers, which I think was smart. But they're basically saying, let's regulate a stable coin this way. Let's do a simple audit every 30 days, full audit of the assets, mm -hmm. okay, every 30 days, and let's allow only two assets to back up the token. One is a one US dollar against one token, or a basket of US treasuries with duration less than 12 months. Okay. So, by the way, those are the same rules of a money market account. Yeah. So for that, that's a very simple piece of legislation. And then if you want to be regulated and be approved, you have to go through those that gauntlet. That to me would be something you could pass easily. I understand there's a you know a fight amongst regulators of who gets to regulate it. Should it be the Fed? Should it be the SEC? Do the states have a role in it? So those turf wars have to be resolved. But if I that's what I would do first as the commissioner. I would say let's get one thing done, and then we start dealing with the complexity of digital commodities like Bitcoin. Are they securities? Are they commodities? All that stuff. But that would show everybody that the regulator is moving in a regulated direction. Also, we need to regulate these exchanges like the Canadians have done. Yes. The BitBuy exchange is a regulated exchange tied to a broker-dealer. Mm -hmm. They can do that here, too. Yeah, I think it needs to be done. Um, where do you see the sector going? I mean, from a maturation perspective and just an overall, I guess, momentum going into the next 12, I, 24 months. I think it flatlines in value until regulation comes, but I also see uh, you know, a good reason to put... I'm putting on positions before year end again. Um, I think getting more noise about regulation is going to actually bolster yeah. crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody wants to go through this. I mean, this is like definition of insanity. Do the same thing over and over again, expect a different outcome. Yeah. I mean, there'll be lots more bankruptcies. There's all kinds of collateral damage yeah. coming. Uh, but it doesn't really matter at this point. I mean, everybody's anticipating it. It's, it's that we have to change what we're doing. And yeah. that's the good, that's the silver lining in this thing. We've scraped the idiot management out of it, and now we get some regulation and let this sector become what it can be. Yeah, I mean, I think we saw that in the NFT space. I mean, like, looking at, like, Bored Apes, looking at the collections, like, when you look at the management teams that brought these products to market, they weren't seasoned entrepreneurs or even investors. They were just regular guys creating a company. Yeah. Six months later, they've got a $5 billion valuation. And as you know, from an investor and from an entrepreneur perspective, that's a very difficult beast. Yeah, I, I never went down that road. I, yeah. I couldn't figure out how to value it and, and how to trade it and what, what it was. And it didn't matter. It, it, listen, it's, it's okay to have fun. It's like going to Las Vegas. If you want to 
buy an NFT and, and you know you enjoy doing it. But when I saw the prices of these JPEGs go up to half a million, yeah. 700,000, I thought that's stupid. I was actively flipping them. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that, that's what my, my, my parents, my friends, they were like, what are you doing? I was like, there's a market, there's alpha to be there, made. Yeah, there was alpha, and, yeah. but it really, really corrected in a brutal way. I mean, it's, I mean, as much as I love NFTs, because I mean, I've met a lot of great people through them, I've learned a lot about them. It's greater fool theory to the to the tenth yeah, degree. Yeah, that is because there's no real long-term economic utility. But yeah. if you believe in the art, yeah. I would rather have the art. Yeah. So that's the way I look. The at. art and the tokenization of physical assets. Like I truly believe that that's where NFTs yeah. Yeah, for, are for, going, and they for, will. For go. authentication, that yeah. makes a lot of sense to me, and I like that. Here's yeah. part of the problem, though, for someone like me. If let's I'm let's at turn around, and go the back the other yeah. direction soon, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's part of the problem I have. For example, with a board ape. If I think that it's going to become the next Star Wars franchise, do I think that I'm getting royalties off that? And we've discussed this. It hasn't even come out yet what that looks like. Yeah. I mean... And, and if you are getting royalties, is that no different than a dividend and that should be a security? It's security. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, one of the reasons that we didn't take on any positions there is it wasn't clear to me how the regulator was going to come down on mm -hmm. that. And the last thing I wanted to, was to be offside yeah. uh, in, in that space. And so with that uncertainty, because one of the things you do when you're issuing uh, securities like or indexes or ETFs is you're in a constant dialogue with your compliance people. And yeah. they're in a constant dialogue with the regulators. And I mean, it's a weekly, daily thing. And so you say, look, can you get some guidance on this asset, like an NFT? Yeah. And you wait 48 hours, you get an answer saying, yeah, we don't like it. Yeah. They don't have to say it's illegal, you can't do it. When they say, we don't like it, that's code for no. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's that simple, yeah. right? It's that simple, right. Okay, what about the battle and with the banks and the Goliath of what they think about crypto? Because, again, as maybe a more generic investor, you're looking at things and going, okay, they're investing in Bitcoin, but then at the same time you have, and you've talked about this, someone like Jamie Dimon saying, it's basically a big ass Ponzi scheme, and don't get involved. And it's involved, involved in trafficking, and you don't yeah. know what to think. No, I, you're listen, like, wait, but you're invested yeah, in it too. I, I understand what he's saying, and, and I, you know, but he is talking his book. Let's face yeah. it. Yeah. Some of these technology technologies are very disruptive to the traditional fee structure of, of yes. money center banks, right. and so I, I would also be saying it's just a big Ponzi scheme too if I was protecting that that that, that income. Uh, but it, it it can't be stopped. I mean. Stable coins for payment systems are coming. That will not be great news yeah. for Jamie Dimon. That will be very, very competitive in terms of the pricing of that. I won't be using uh, money center banks to transfer assets anymore once it's regulated. I'll be using, you know, an account at a regulated uh, stable coin, and so um, so will others. I mean, that's the whole point. And, and so th that disruption is coming. And so I think. He's smart enough to know that he, he has to establish a Bitcoin trading desk. He probably already has. They have it. Yeah, yeah they have yeah. it. So, so that is a real asset. His clients want it, he, whether he likes it or not. He's, he's got to provide that service. I, I think it's all noise. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I think all of this stuff is noise versus the potential of what uh, crypto can be. And, and I've had so many people. It's, there's so much, you know. Uh, it's so crazy out there right now, given what's happened just in social media. But who, it's irrelevant because it doesn't change the promise of what crypto can be. Yeah, you have, you have to look at it from the lens of a technology. It's a technology. It's a technological tool. Yeah, it's just it's, software. Yeah. I've always said that from the beginning. It's all software. You, you use Word. You use Excel. That's yeah. software. Then you're going to use a stablecoin for transfer. Yeah, it's software. Who cares? It's all the same stuff. Somehow emotions got into this, and it started with a community of people saying we want to be decentralized, we don't want to be controlled by government. That, that's all crap, because you want guardrails so that yes. you can feel safe about putting an asset in an allocation. That's it. I mean, I kind of compare it to what we see today with the traditional internet and the dark web. Like, yeah. there are users that still use the dark web. There's probably still going to be that true decentralized movement of crypto, but we're not going to need to transact on that. We're going to, need to, we're going to be yeah. able to transact at or, scale. Or, or in some jurisdictions, yeah. they'll make it illegal, and those guys run the risk of, yeah. you know. But if you look at China, every time they've banned Bitcoin, it's ripped. Yeah. It's every, it's all six times. Yeah. It's, it's, it's ripped on I the I think news. they're going to stop doing that. They figured out what's going on. Yeah. I mean, Bitcoin mining is going through a lot of pressure because of the amount of electricity it uses and yeah. the issues around ESG and all that. But there's lots of new projects being set up around hydro and nuclear power. Yeah. And so it's, it's a very efficient way to, to use electricity and store the value of it. Yeah.
How often are you getting pitches uh, from companies in this space? More than ever. I mean, our, the, our deal flow now is insane because there's there hasn't been a if you if you are trying to finance a crypto project right now. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> it's tough. It's very, it's very it's very difficult. We're actually in the process of it right now. Yeah, it's, um, it's but you're, whatever you're doing, your yeah. valuation is going to be down sixty to eighty percent. Yeah. I mean, it's just getting liquidity, getting actually an investor to give you something is is the hallmark of, of sustainability if you yep. can do it. Um, we're very, very selective. We, we, we have a pretty big book already, so we have to decide which ones we're going to keep investing and which ones we're going to just let go bankrupt. Are you investing in infrastructure plays or mostly tokens in like the open market? Or you are doing some private stuff? I'm doing private stuff, but okay. I, I must say what I'm really interested in investing in now are um, regulated exchanges tied to broker dealers. Yes. Because all of a sudden you see the merit and the value. Yeah. And, and over time those will appreciate. So, um, I, you know, I've got a pretty big position in BitBuy and WonderFi up in Canada. I'm looking for more opportunities there. I mean, that it's going to happen in other countries too. I recently uh, became a citizen of the United Arab Emirates. Okay. I'm very interested in the ADGM in Abu Dhabi. Uh, they're kind of the hub of that region. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity to do what we did in Canada there. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities and we're just, we're, we, uh, but I, Look, when there's chaos, there's opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And there's opportunity right now. It's like, I hate to be cliche, it's like when, when Warren says there's blood in the streets, there's plenty of opportunity and plenty of buying. Yeah, it's, it's right now people are buying Bitcoin, they're, they're buying crypto. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's not going away, it's just been a really, really rough month. Yeah. And you think regulation will be the biggest turnaround? Because also the questions we get are, okay, how does the bear turn around? Obviously the entire you know, financial industry needs to turn around, but what about in this sector in particular, where is the jump going to be? I remember a conversation um, that you had with uh, a, a talk that I was in um, during the pandemic, and you were like, it's going to, I mean, the market in general you were talking about is, is going to burst, and it's going to be two or three days that are going to bring everything back to normal. So in this space, where do you think the news pops up that brings us back to a, a level where you're pleased? I think what happens now is obviously we're going into the holiday, and so nothing will happen this mm -hmm. month. But yeah. you will see, particularly after Jan third, when the house flips, um, politically there, there'll be a lot of pressure uh, to start to make announcements about the direction of regulation and compliance and investigation and all that stuff. There'll be a focus on that, and and I think that will be the turning point in um, in a new, more disciplined crypto market. Yeah. And, uh, and it, and, and so you'll start to see, uh, you know, in the first and second and third quarter next year, some semblance of stability and, and sanity to this space. And it, it, you know, you've already heard the large financial institutions like Fidelity and, and J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley, they're all realizing their clients want yeah. allocation to this stuff. So um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. And I think these, these horrific stories that are occurring now, they're going to go into the background. Yeah, there already are. Yep. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, our news cycle is forty-eight hours. Now. Yes, and in, in, in Web three, it's even shorter. <laughs> it's, it's twenty. It's twenty-four hours. Yeah, you, you mint out an NFT in twenty-four hours. Yeah, no, you, I get you, it. Your old, your old news. So it's it's really uh, it's interesting to watch this happen.